welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. This is episode 47. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. We're going to spend a lot of time in Sweden for this episode. And as you know, Sweden's got a very rich knitting heritage. And one of our main interview guests is the Swedish knitter Karen Karnlund, who is an expert on two-end or twined knitting. Karen is totally dedicated to this old way of knitting, which originates in the rural areas of Dalarna in Sweden. She's done a ton of research into its histories. She's actually got some original items of two-end knitted clothing dating back to the 1800s in her own private collection. And she's also making replicas of museum pieces to keep the knowledge alive. So I totally love her passion. You're going to see some of these replicas and the original pieces in the interview, so I think it's a really fascinating interview. And while we're still in Sweden, we're going to hear Pia Kammerborn talk about her latest mitten pattern in new releases. Yep. We have a second feature interview, which will take us to Cumbria in the UK, where we meet Alison O'Neill, who is a shepherdess, traditional shepherdess, works her flock on a hillside farm there. Yeah. Alison is a romantic and a dreamer. Yeah. And I think quite possibly the best dressed shepherdess in the UK. Definitely. She, she wanders the moors dressed in tweeds um, made from the fleeces from her very own sheep. Yeah. She has a really fascinating story to tell and uh, it's a real treat to have her on the show. We are also going to be announcing the winners of our Fruity Steaked Cow. So that's exciting, but yep. right now. But right now it's bring and brag with Andrew. Yay. I know that some of you will be very pleased to see that this project is completed and off my needles. I am very ha happy to have got to the end of it. I've enjoyed doing it. Um, so this is Paris's Scarf by Nancy Marchant. I'm still deliberating over who will get to have the scarf. I'm, I'm heading towards sharing it amongst the family because I suspect everyone will want to wear it at some time. That's a good idea. For the time being, I'm wearing it, which is really great because the temperatures here in Frankfurt have just dropped yeah. to about freezing point, which is 32 degrees Fahrenheit for our American viewers. Yeah. Um, the project it was a really good project for me. Um, it, it was a little bit more difficult. Nancy Marchant said when she was on the show, if you want to master the brioche stitch, then the way to do it is to do a major project or a large project. Yeah. This most certainly was a large project for me. Um, and, uh, you know, once you've done your thousand barks and burps and yarn overs, then you'll be have the, the brioche stitches under control and have them happening pretty much automatically. Yeah. That kind of happened for me. I think it took a little bit more than a thousand stitches. I think it was in the several thousands. <laughs> And, Did you uh, calculate how many thousand stitches? There are many, many stitches in here. Yeah. Many, many thousands of stitches, I'm sure. And the, the yarn overs count. Yes. Okay. They are included as stitches. <laughs> they are not just free. Um, yeah. So I've got to the show end. the quick end. The, Look you've at done the, the ends. Ending. The ends match. We yeah. didn't just stop at the end of the ball, did we, darling? No, we, we stopped before the, instructions. the end of the ball. <laughs> we followed the instructions and did it properly and now we it did. matches. It's yeah. beautiful. So it's beautiful. I did get some comments. I'm not sure if everyone reads the comments on our YouTube videos. <laughs> but there were, we there were some comments from some astute viewers who noticed that I knit very slowly and the, <laughs> the comments included words like painful and agonizing, laborious, and laborious, um, mesmerizing. And, yeah, the, the series of <laughs> comments ending in mesmerizing. It is true. I knit slowly, <laughs> but I, um, we concede. <laughs> I, I thought about it. I thought, it doesn't I, I'm not, I don't really care. I'm, I'm not in this to tick off lots of projects. If it takes a long time, well, that's how it is. And the things that we make, I think this is for both of us, they're really special things and we want them to last for years and to enjoy them for years. And if it takes a bit longer, that doesn't really matter. So this is my piece of wisdom out to the world. If you are a knitter who, um, you know, knit thinks, slowly, knit slowly <laughs> either because you're a beginner or because you just, Knit That's slowly. just how it goes. <laughs> For whatever reason, just don't worry about it and, and enjoy it. And you know, That's a good piece end, of advice for the rest of your life of as well. <laughs> yeah. It's applicable in all, all areas. Yeah. Yep. So that was that. This is my next piece of work. This is a swatch that I am doing because um, it's a sample for a vest that Andrea is designing for me. Mm-hmm. And before we go any further, I have to be clear here. In Australia, a vest is essentially a jumper without sleeves. Yeah. So it's kind of a mid, mid season, um, between seasons garment. Um, in the UK, we've understood that a vest is an undershirt or what we would call a singlet. 
and they would call a vest a tank top. And this is where it gets really tricky <laughs> because for an Australian, a tank top is really something that is a, sexy. Yeah, a teenage girl or a young woman would wear. It's generally slinky, sexy, light material. Showing mid wrists. <laughs> it's probably exactly what our daughter is wearing in Australia right now. It's a hot weather garment. Yeah. So, and we just need to get clear. You're making me a vest and not a tank top. That's true. Yeah. Definitely. Good. I don't want to see you in a midriff. <laughs> Good. I don't want to even think about that. <laughs> okay. So I'll tell you a little bit about this. So this is his swatch that he's been working on. And the wool we're using is um, Donna Smith's yarn called Langsund. It is a natural shade of grey from her very own flock of Shetland sheep. And it's in a DK weight. And Donna talks about this yarn and also gives Andrew a personal fleece sorting lesson yes, at her home fleece. at her home with the hills and the sea behind it's it's a very fun episode um, that's in episode 40 if you haven't seen it so this is the yarn we're using and I have been trying to figure out how I'm going to design this this vest because ideally Andrew would just love to knit and stocking stitch in the round I think I don't think that's quite true you don't think so no but I think uh, we need to exercise the brain a little bit more than that <laughs> <laughs> and so I had thought okay he's never done cables before so maybe I can um, design something with cables on it but it is DK weight and when you do cables in a DK weight it's going to end up being pretty thick because you've got at least two layers of fabric and insulation and men can be a little bit funny with their heating they can heat up very quickly and above all this has to be a very practical garment that he feels comfortable wearing as often as possible so yep. I figured we don't want to go with cables and we don't want to have this too thick um, garment because if it's warm enough that you don't need sleeves on your jumper you don't want a really thick vest yeah I understand I that logic okay so I've come up with a fairly simple pattern stitch pattern out of knit and purl stitches and this is it here the right way and it's basically just a three by three rib but it's staggered so that you can see it's going to turn into sort of like a very big series a series of V's coming like this all down the garment and I think this will be very flattering for the male form because it'll broaden out the shoulders here and it'll slim down the waist yeah. down here so I'm hoping it's going to look really good on you yeah but I, I don't actually need that <laughs> help do I Dals? you don't need to have broader shoulders so, and a slimmer well, waist what do you think no <laughs> but it'll that. accentuate your beauty <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. so we've been working on a swatch. <laughs> we started with size four, uh, not size four, four millimeter needles, and then we went down to three point seven five, and now we're down to three point three point five. Yeah. Are we stopping at three point five? I think dolls? so. I think we're at a okay. at a texture that I like. <clears throat> um, what's important, I think, for these sort of V stripes to stand out well is that the ga that it's not too sloppy, it's not too loose that it's a little bit firmer. It'll also help because the yarn is a woolen spun and woolen spun will tend to peel a slightly more than worsted spun. And so by knitting it at a slightly tighter gauge, it'll help prevent that. And it just means that you can wear it for a long time without it getting sort of sloppy or out of shape and having to wash it again and, and get it all right. So yeah. it should end up being a good wearable fabric that'll look good after many wears. Sounds good to me. Yeah, so that's what I'm aiming for. So we have to just knit a little bit more and then wash it to see if anything strange happens with this swatch, which I don't expect it will. And then I have to start doing calculations, have to measure you all up and start figuring out how many stitches to, to cast on and where to increase Good for you. So that's your new project. I'm looking forward to that. So like we said, we've got two feature interviews in this episode and you're going to see the first feature interview very, very soon. But first of all, I just want to tell you a little bit about two-end knitting because back in September last year, Andrew and I were at the Shetland Wool Week and I took just one class there and that was advanced two-end knitting with Karen Carnlun, who you're about to meet. I'd never heard of, of two-end knitting before, so I had to quickly look it up and try to teach myself the basics so I could attend this class. And... This is my little example 
of this is going to be the beginning of a mitten done in this technique uh, with the proper yarn that's used and this technique dates back to at least the 1600s and it is in a technique where you use two strands from the same ball so both ends of the ball and you alternate as you're knitting you alternate each strand and you twist the strands around each other in between each stitch so it takes at least five times as long as normal knitting but that's not the point it creates a different fabric it, it creates quite a stiff fabric that's closer to a woven material it doesn't have any elasticity in it so the technique of the knitting itself together with the, the special way that the yarn is made because it is spun in a, in a different way and it's used with a, a, a rare Swedish sheep breed is used that has a very long staple so it's incredibly strong in fact if I show you this here I'm going to try to pull it apart and you can't it's it's pure wool but it's like it would be string it's it's amazing so it's tough it's going to be around at the end of time and when you see some of the garments that um, that date back to the 1800s that Karen is going to show you in just a minute they look brand new it's yeah. extraordinary to see them and it's because of this technique so the white background is knitted in the two end technique and the red and the green is knitted like normal stranded knitting over the top. So in this case you're using three strands, two whites and the third one either being the red or the green. Although the front white section looks to be like very tight stocking stitch, if you look at the inside version, the back white section doesn't have the typical pearl bumps that the backside of stocking stitch has it's just got these ridges or lines. Karen is very passionate about preserving this technique and all the knowledge that goes with it because apparently and they only found this out relatively recently everybody was knitting in this way before the 19th century and then in the 19th century it changed and people started to knit the continental way with the yarn in the left hand. This is done very similar to the English stranded knitting. But you're going to find out why in just a minute in this interview that's coming up. So I hope you really enjoy it. We'll see you on the other side. Welcome. Today I'm in Lerik, Shetland and I'm with Karen Karnlund. Karen is Swedish and she's come over for the Shetland Wool Week because she's going to do some classes here and I'm taking one of her classes tomorrow and that's the advanced two-end knitting class and I'd never heard of two-end knitting before I saw this class advertised in the brochure. So it's a less known technique so it's fantastic to have an expert like Karen with us today and we've got a whole table full of these beautiful garments that are made out of this two-end knitting technique and some of them are antiques and some of them are new. So it's really exciting to be able to hear a bit of the history, what kind of garments were used and how to do this technique. So thank you for joining us. Yes, uh, thank, thank you for inviting me. Uh, two in knitting is I used uh, I used two threads when I'm knitting, and I use the thread inside the ball and outside the ball. I make a loop around it, and I use it like this. And then I hold the threads in my right hand, and I twist them while I'm knitting, so they are all twisted like this. It gets um, warm and um, strong garment and it lasts for a long time. It takes takes a long time knitting but it lasts 10 times longer when you're using. So Very well wearing. Yes yeah. it is. And uh, traditional it has been, you always knit in a circle like this and it has been made as uh, mittens, gloves, sleeves, um, hats, stockings. So and uh, maybe the technique is the way we started knitting in Sweden or Scandinavia, you don't know. But to start with, we 
all were holding the threads in the right hand. And it was not until the beginning of 1900 uh, we started the continental way of knitting. Um, and how did that, why did it change to continental? I, I think um, before the, you wanted the, the knitted thing to be, be um, like a woven material. But in the early 1900s, you wanted the elasticity. Elasticity. Thank you. You want the stretchiness. Yes. Yes. And at the same time, we had a new school system in Sweden. Everyone should learn to knit. And they wanted to teach everyone to have the continental way. And so suddenly, this was the right thing to do. Okay. And the old thing was not allowed in the school. But still, the technique was uh, surviving. It kept going. Yeah. Yes, and that's fantastic. I think when a mother to daughter thing to do and to yeah. learn. Yeah. So, but it was nearly forgotten. I think in some ways, um, in 1974, they suddenly found a, a glove like this. In uh, yes, this should be. <laughs> A glove like this, they found a meat glove in uh, Falun and they thought it was, yes, but now we know it was, it is from 1580. Wow. And uh, it looks like, it looks like ordinary knitting here, but when they turned it inside out, you can see the striped, oh, you have to see, maybe. That's got a pattern on it. Yes. Now. Um, this one we can see. Mm -hmm. It's typical for the two knitting is the, stripes, the lines here on the back side. And suddenly the museum people found out that everything, nearly everything, was made this way in the museum, but nobody thought it was something special. So uh, they started to investigate and found some ladies, at least one, <laughs> who still could do this typical uh, structured pattern. Uh, it's like um, pearl and knit stitches and in, done with the two threads in a special way. She was the one lady who still could do it. Uh, so in other words, they didn't realize that this was a different technique. No. They found one glove, they noticed that it had stripes on the background and then they went through their whole collection yes. and were surprised to find that the majority of them mm. also had stripes. Yes. And then mm. they thought, aha. Uh -huh. We didn't realize that no. we had a different knitting technique. No, no. <laughs> and um, a lot of people could do just plain, uh, rough uh, worker mit mittens mm -hmm. for, because they needed it. Mm -hmm. they, they had been used for hundreds of years. But um, all these, the things I brought here is um, uh, some of them are parts of our uh, folk costumes and these are it has kept the technique because we use the full costumes, but it's not so many who could do it. Okay. So, so the fact that you do have a strong um, costumes, I suppose, like in Bavaria in Germany, mm -hmm. at the celebrations where everybody still dresses up in yes. their national costume, that it kept people still doing the exact techniques. Yes. Yeah. yes. Great. So when did you first discover it and why do you particularly love it? Uh, yes, I, I'm, my mother is from Stockholm. The, she, she, could, she cannot do a knitting. So I learned the continental way to begin with. And I'm always taught, uh, they, everyone said to me, it is, I'm doing it too tight. And then when I was about 20, I joined the class and uh, I met to a knitting and thought, this is my way of knit, because it can never be too tight, so that's good. And I'm also so interested in how to do, how to do it, and how to, uh, I can, you can also see so many different ways of doing the patterns with colors and so on. So the historical thing is very important to me too. So there's endless ways just inside this technique that you can experiment with. Yes, yeah, yes. That's great. And there is a particular yarn that you have to use for it, isn't there? Yes. 
Uh, I use uh, yarn from a small uh, mill in uh, Dalarna, the area I grew up in. And it's the fourth generation spinners. Um, they do it, uh, it's S spun and Z plied. I would like to show you the difference when I knit with the Z plied. Here you can see the, the this is a Z plied yarn. Yeah. You can see the line from, from the right to the left. Left, yeah. Yes. And I, when I knit with Z plied, you see it's it's plain like this. The stitches are flat. flat. Uh, when I use the S one, it's um, here you can see the diagonal like this way coming from top to down. And here you see the surface is like the, the stitches are on top of each other. And uh, it looks like stripes or lines like yes. this. And this uh, item can also, uh, when it's uh, knitted, it could twist or turn. Okay, like this. so when it's knitted in the round, mm -hmm. it can the bias of it can twist. Yes, so that's why um, it's important because you use your time. It takes so much time. I think that you have to choose a good quality of the yarn. And the fleece is important, isn't it? Yes, uh, the small mill I work together with, they, they, can, they have old machines. The machines can make yarns with long, uh, long stables. Long, yes. The fleece has long stables. And so we, I also want to preserve the Swedish breeds of Svensk Lantras and especially the uh, Ria. Lantria. <laughs> so is that a rare Swedish breed of sheep? It is, it is. Uh, new spinning mills cannot use this okay. one, so, but uh, this, the, this old one can do. They use the lamb wood. They have to mix it a little bit with the medium length fleece too, but it's um, the lamb wool of Ria is making a shining, shining one. Lustrous. Yes, yeah. yes. And that's oh. because of the long staple yes, as well. Yes, it is. And that would make it stronger as well, is that it, right? Of course, yes. Yeah. Together with two and knitting technique and this good good one, yeah, you have a fantastic material. So. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's because of the fleece, the hard, the long uh, fleece, which mm -hmm. makes knitting stronger anyway, yes. and the technique that you've got a material that can really wear for forever. years, forever. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, this fleece also makes it um, shining when it's used a lot. It's, it's very good. As you can see on the table, we have a whole array of beautiful, colourful projects. So Karen, you're going to tell us now, um, you're going to go through these projects and because and, uh, some of them are very old and perhaps tell us what they date back to and the typical techniques that are used because two-end knitting is just the basis and you can do a lot of different variations with it, can't you? I, I think I start with this one. It's, it's just a typical way of doing two-end knitting with a structure like this with the hook stitches. But um, then you have all these colour works and it's so amazing, I think. Uh, I brought a jacket from Gangnef in Dalarna. Uh, this is an old one. Uh, also, this is the, the Dala Floda. It's coming, it's just a village close to each other. Uh, the, this was, it became fashion in 1860. And I think this is about late 1800. And maybe this, this is, uh, has got new, the new bodice. bodice. Yes, yeah. but this is uh, the, That's original. the original one. So, uh, and I want to talk about how to do the patterns. So here in this part, this area, you make the two and knitting with one uh, thread of each color. So one red and one black. Originally they were made, made white and black and dyed when it was finished, okay. but it's easy for me to, me to talk about red and black. Yes. yes. 
So one red and one black and you twist the threads around each other for every stitch. It's the same technique as this one. So it's um, so many twists. But then when you come up to this part, you still here you use two red threads still going mm -hmm. doing twisting, twisting every stitch yes. yeah uh, but these small figures they have one black thread each so for this one i cut a piece of thread black and i start to figure in the in the middle of the black thread so mm -hmm. and i need the right Side of the motif? Yes, uh, with the one uh, side yes. of it. Okay. And then other ones. So inside it looks like this. It looks like this. Okay, so that looks mm. like our intarsia. It is a very good one. And uh, when I, uh, I had the opportunity to meet a lady from Dalla Floda, she is about 92, I think now, mm -hmm. and I thought, I knew how to make patterns, but and I said, "Oh, you're twisting every stitch." No, she said, <laughs> <laughs> um, "We don't do that way in Fluda. In Dalla Fluda, we she were knitting. They are knitting two red stitches and then twist around the black thread." So, okay, so, so they twist every second stitch. Every second. That's the Fluda way. <laughs> and does that make the fabric look different? Yes, you can see it's a little bit. Um, uh, it's a little bit like Got a diagonal yes. stripe. You can see it here, and of course you can see it inside. If we turn it a little bit, you can see the yes. striped here. Yes, the lines. Mm. So this is Dalla Fluda way. Uh -huh. And you were saying before that these come from two villages that are Close right to each other. by each other. Yes. So the lady who knitted this, mm -hmm. there's only a little stream between yeah. her yeah. house mm -hmm. and this uh -huh. house. Yes. And if you were uh, married in the village, you have to change technique. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm. uh, this is coming from another part of Dalarna. It's called Rettvik. This is for ladies and this is for a man. And uh, here the lady, she should uh, use uh, uh, its red wool together with uh, linen. In the pattern, so and it's twisted all the time. So this, those two are also antique. They maybe 100, 120 years old, okay. I think. Mm. And the man's is a lot more colourful. Yes, they. Are. He's a peacock. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and you see, they should be wide. It's Enough so many a, stitches. Yeah. Yes. So and inside here, you twist it all the time. It's. Um, it's hard work to do, but it's very beautiful. It's, uh, exactly, and that's 120 years old. Yes, it and is. it looks very like there's a lot of wear yes. left yes. in it. Mm. That's amazing. I just I just got one, but I'm happy for one. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then we have one more. Um, I think it's here. Yes, this is another area in Dalarna. It's close to this, but it's a little bit up north in Dalarna. This is called the uh, Ore Sukken. This is for a lady. They have white ones with ray, red patterns. Here uh, you are doing um, two and knitting with two white threads, but the red one is uh, float, floating. Okay. I think. So the background yes. material is done in two ends. So yes. you're twisting the whites mm. around mm. each other, but you're just using a third strand yes. of red and that's stranded with floats like we mm. do with stranded knitting. It is, yes, that's the way. But also here you can see if you're a man, this is my knitting I'm doing now. This is from the same area but it's so fantastic with all the color work. This part is made, um, yes the brown is made in two and knitting mm -hmm. and when they make this uh, red on the red bottom they just make ordinary okay um, so this is ordinary stranded it is the pattern yes. sections yes. Yes. ordinary and, and also the... here up here okay but this part is two and knitted and um, here you you use one red thread for this one one green for this one so this is 
Intasia. Like Intasia too. And also you have here uh, one red and blue stitch coming <laughs> on the top. So you can see where the thumb gusset okay. is. Okay, so, so we've got a whole combination. So in other words, you can do all of the techniques that we know as knitters, as mm -hmm. modern knitters, Intasia yes. and stranded knitting, yes. in combination with with two end. It, it's not the common way. The common way is when you're a beginner, you think you should, and um, a lot of people think two end knitting is just twisting every stitch. But mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to meet old people from different uh, villages, and they tell me, no, this is the way we do it. So the more you learn, the more you can see you can change, or you're allowed to do it different ways. It's just the basis. Yes. Yeah, so. that's great. So the two end knitting is always on the parts of the of the garment or the that that is hard wearing. Yes. So the fingers is. and mm. the palms. Yes. That's great. Um, that's... And this is two end knitting all over. So yes. So I bet you're all just dying to see the expert knit. So Karen is now going to show us what it looks like. And you're going to start with a cast on, aren't you? Yes, I am, because I, the cast on is important and uh, it gets, uh, it's a good start on. So I used two threads from my white ball and I use a red string. You always need three threads to begin with. I make a loop like this. I put it in on and I just use one needle and I put the needle here. I'm catching the red thread. I'm using my right hand for the white ones. Putting down two fingers, I take the threads here, over the other and under the needle. And like this. And then you have to strengthen. Now it's the next one. Over. Like this. So to me that looks like um, a long tail cast on, but, which is what I use, except you've got two threads in the right hand and you're alternating, twisting and alternating yes. them. Yes, and you, you, the twist is important. And um, I do some more. So this is the back side and this is the front here. You can see it's the more red here. And because I'm twisting so much, I have to do like this. So it's untwisting. Yes. So, But I can do this cast on when I do ordinary common knitting too. So yes. I like it a lot. And the, the loop you take off. When okay, it's like so. great. Mm -hmm. This is one, the most common way to cast on. You can do it in other ways too, but this is most used. Uh, this is what I'm knitting now. I'm making a replica of an old uh, uh, sweat sleeve from Dalla Floda, the same area as this one. I think it's so interesting how they did it. This Here you can see there's a small square. Uh, this is the, the, the size you need. Yeah, <laughs> yes. that's the lower part of the sleeve, yes. so it's more yes. narrow. And here you need more, um, you have increased, you make a bigger pattern, mm -hmm. motif, and I have increased more, and then I use the same motif as here, but I make it a little bit bigger, so. Okay, so you just, and then this one you'll repeat here yes, and make that even here. bigger. Yes, it will be. So. Okay, so you don't really see the increases, you just see the motifs get yes, bigger yes. as the sleeve yes, gets bigger. Yes, and now I do the knitting. So I have one red and one black thread. I, have, I already knitted two black ones. So now I have to twist around the red one like this. And one. And now I need a red one coming. Red. So you can see that it's very similar two. to a very basic way of English throwing. Yes. So English throwers would find it quite easy to pick up. Yes, for Swedish students or Swedish people, it's difficult, this, to have the, the threads in your right hand. They have to practice a lot, but, but uh, when you learn it, and if you take your time doing it the right way, I think uh, it's getting quicker. <laughs> 
Karen, that has been really fascinating to learn more about this technique. I'm going to learn even more tomorrow, which is my class with you. But thank you so much for spending time with us and show and bringing these gorgeous uh, jackets and, and old ancient gloves to show us and to talk about the different possibilities with the technique. It's been really interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I um, wish you luck with your uh, further development and recording of these skills because it's very important to you isn't it to to keep this knowledge going and to keep the knowledge of the sheep breeds going yeah. and also the special way of spinning it's yes. all, they all work together don't they the three yes for me it's important to be to keep the tradition going yeah. on yeah. Yes. And, and with your replicas of designs mm -hmm. from the past and from museums I think that's fantastic work mm -hmm. so thank you very much thank you thank you so let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>to announce the winners of our fruity steaked garment cow. We need a drum roll. Brrr, <laughs> there. <laughs> so I was actually in a bagpipe band as a kid, you yes, know, playing that's right. the side drum. This is my retirement plan. Yeah, you're going to play the bagpipe I'm going to play the bagpipe. get out my side drum. Yeah. Okay, anyway, the, back to the, the Carl winner. So this can. was a knit along where you had to knit up a garment that included a steak in it. And we were so impressed and excited about the participation that went on in this thread. There was a lot of brave new knitters attempting and succeeding in cutting up their knitting yeah. and a lot of veterans who were offering their advice and their encouragement. It was just a really wonderful thread. So thank you so much to all of you for your yeah. participation. I was, I was really impressed with the number of people jumping in and um, getting into steaking for the very first time. Yeah, that's great. That's really, really good. I've so, only ever cut your knitting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's different. <laughs> yes. I was pretty brave letting you. <laughs> you were very brave. <laughs> I think that's back in one of the early, early episodes. Yep. It might be 15 or so. Yep. Um, I let Andrew cut my steak on camera after having some scotch whiskey. Yeah. Very dangerous. I needed the scotch. Okay, let's move on. We've got some lovely presents for you, that's right. prizes for you. You all deserved a prize. There were so many great things in there, and we'd love to all to give each one of you a prize, but we can't afford it, so it's just three. <laughs> but anyway, the first prize was donated from a lovely Australian lady, and her Etsy shop is made by Ganache. And it's this lovely interfaced lined project bag with pockets inside and also a snap closure small pocket for your little bits and pieces. And as you know, we're Australian, so we love Australian animals on the material. We think that's gorgeous. And if you have a look at the stitch markers, they're also all Australian animals. So this is a very special prize. And the prize is going to Jan from Sherman, Texas. Yay, well done, Yay. Jan. And Jan knitted a stunning version of Mary Jane Mucklestone's cardigan, Jenny at the Fair. So, yep. well done. Yeah. The second prize that we have is actually we're donating the prize, and that is your choice of any of the patterns of Pierre Camerborn. Um, these patterns are all really charming. I find them totally Swedish, which is beautiful. They're very well thought out and well written, and they're available in both English and Swedish. And the winner of this prize is Christina, who is Nishi Knits. And Christina does happen to come from Sweden. Which is a great coincidence. What a happy coincidence. <laughs> um, Christina knitted this fantastic cardigan for her husband. And he's a picture of the very hip gentleman himself sporting his new cardigan. So, Christina, if you get in touch with us, a uh, personal message on Ravelry and let us know what pattern you would like from PR, then we will send that out to you. The third prize is also donated by us, and this is really exciting. It is a copy of the book, which is almost ready to be released to the, publish, uh, to the public, and that is Susan Crawford's new book, Vintage Shetland. Um, this is an epic book, a really significant volume, 
which will be an extremely valuable, a beautiful addition to your library. The winner of this book is Isabel from Switzerland, who has the revelry name Filidruad. It's a tricky name. That was well done. <laughs> yeah. Well, we think so. Isabel knitted this beautiful kofta design by Cicel Hojevic, and we spoke to Cicely in episode 30. So well done for, to Isabel for that. It is a really stunning piece of work. So like we said, this book has not been released yet. It's due to come out any, any time. So you'll have to be a little bit patient for your prize. Yeah. But as soon as it comes out, we'll buy it and send it to you. So could everybody send personal uh, message me on Ravelry and send me your shipping address if I have to send something out to you. And Christine, could you... Pick your favourite pattern from Pierre Kummerborn's collection and um, we'll buy it and send that to you. But you, you all need to personal message me on Ravelry. Thank you so much for your participation, everybody. Yep, bravo. So it's time to start some new carls and I've had a whole lot of ideas bouncing around my head and we're going to announce a new carl today in this episode and that's going to be the Modify Your Garment Carl. <laughs> and that's because I've been talking a lot about how I modify things and the processes and we have some excellent knitters in our viewership who modify their garments all the time so I thought it would be great to create a forum where um, people can talk about the modifications that they're making because there'll be a whole lot of different body types and shapes and style preferences so you're going to learn something simply by reading through all of the chit chat even if you don't participate but we do hope you do participate yep. if you do participate there are rules there are serious rules because this is a serious cal um, the first rule is it has to be a garment we're talking about garment projects here not small things not modifying a scarf um, <laughs> So the idea is that you tell us what garment you're working on or you're planning to do and what modifications you're planning to do. So you can get in right now and put that on the, uh, the cow thread. Um, really, we're after something that's a little bit brave. So extending a sleeve or extending a length of a garment generally won't qualify unless it's a, like an all-over lace or an all-over um, ferrule pattern and it takes some real knitting wizardry to make that work. Yes. <laughs> so they're the rules. Um, yeah. Typical examples that you could do is maybe change a neckline from a crew neck to a V-line or make a cardigan into a jumper or vice versa or a vest, cut the sleeves off and recalculate how to do this. Yeah, um, I did see one project where somebody turned a sweater into a skirt, which I thought was pretty good. Yeah, that's an option. Um, or else you could do what I'm often doing is um, recalculating a pattern to fit a different gauge or a different yarn choice. So write your pattern down, write down the modifications that you're planning and write down your progress as you do it. And it should make for really interesting reading and, and um, discussion between yep. everybody. So we're excited about that and we hope you join in. I want to show you a couple of the things, other things that I've been working on. Um, if I show you this, this is Marie. Was, you've shown us this before. I have. This is Marie Wallen at Samfree and it probably looks like I haven't done a stitch since I showed you last episode, but indeed I have. I have. You've done them all. <laughs> <laughs> I've ripped back to the ribbing and re-knitted this. I've actually taken 10 centimetres out of the circumference of it because, and I'm knitting the size uh, small, small and I've actually got the exact gauge that the pattern is written for. But it just didn't work for me. This ribbing here at the bottom is a one by one rib, which means that it's going to lie flat against your body anyway. The top of the ribbing comes a little bit below your natural waist, so the top of your hip. And so what it was doing is that it was following my body up to there and then all of this was kind of uh, blousening or blossoming out like a little bit like a weird 1980s design of, of having um, like a, a shirt or a blouse or something and it just did not look good on my body type and there was I didn't want to put this work into it and not be able to wear it at all so I've actually taken 10 centimeters out of this which is the circumference yeah, yeah. So then now I have to increase to make sure that I'm wide enough across here and in the shoulders because it is a drop shoulder. So I have done work on that. <laughs> now, here is my um, design by Caitlin Hunter. It's a beautiful design. Look how draped it is. You're showing how it drapes there. Yeah. Jiggle, jiggle. 
I am. And you can see that the bottom of it's got this lovely lace on it. Very happy with how this is working out. Um, so in the design, Caitlin says to pick up stitches around the armhole and knit a, a short little summery uh, sleeve. And I am knitting long sleeves, as I've all told you, because I want to make it into a winter garment. And I want to have this lovely little ruffle or frill right at the bottom of my sleeve. So it meant that I had to start at the cuff and work up. So that's what I've done. I haven't done very much so far, but um, it's underway. That's what it's looking like. And what I have to do is make sure that I actually have the right circumference at the top of the sleeve that's going to fit in here well. So I have to keep my eye on the maths of that. Yep. Thales, can I ask... Do you, when you're watching that, do you look at the number of stitches or the length that you need here? Both. Both, okay. Because <laughs> the number of stitches will be my gauge, which will be the length. <laughs> All right. You're the maths head, Dals. Yeah, I know. You know more than me. Well, I think that's a bit of a broad statement, Dals, but yeah. <laughs> okay. So some people have asked me to talk a little bit about blocking or how I block. So I thought I'd make the shortest of short uh, video <laughs> footages showing how I blocked this garment and some of my thoughts in general on blocking, some of my reminiscence and or meditation meditations, on this reflections week. <laughs> on blocking. So that's coming up right now. It's very short. Straight after that, you're going to meet Pierre Camerborn. <laughs> I'm going to show you how I blocked this lacy top which is a design by Caitlin Hunter and as I do it I'll also share a few of my thoughts on blocking because firstly in general I only use blocking as a means to reshape my garment as a last resort because basically the size and shape of the garment is best determined by the knitting and not the blocking so I would much prefer to rip out and re-knit so the fit is better than to try to stretch the garment into shape through blocking because the result will never be as good and it often means that you have to re-block to the exact measurements every time you wash the garment. So I'm running lukewarm water and while this is happening I'm going to summarize three different approaches to blocking and the first one is wet blocking which is what I'm doing and it means that you soak the knitting as you would to wash the garment then you lay it out and you pin it in shape and let it dry and wet blocking is best for when you want to make the biggest difference in the appearance or the behavior of the fabric and you can wet block all fiber types. So I'm squeezing my garment down now so all the air bubbles come up and the fibre absorbs as much water as possible. So while I'm doing that, I'm going to tell you about misting. So misting is pinning out the garment in pieces or whole and either steaming them or misting them with cool water and letting them dry. And you can also cover the garment with a wet towel and let the towel dry. This is a quicker method and it's good for simply evening out the stitches on wool and delicate fibres. But probably with cotton and linen, you're better working with wet blocking. So I'm going to leave the garment to soak for 20 minutes and while it's soaking, I'm going to tell you about steaming. And steaming is when you pin the garment out and hold a hot steaming iron over the top without touching the garment. And steaming is the quickest and is good for blocking little sections of knitting. But don't steam silk or synthetic or cellulose fibres. So when I'm draining the sink like I'm doing now, I press the garment against the sides to squeeze out the water. And this garment is merino or kid mohair, so it's not likely to stretch much, but I'm supporting the garment's weight with my hands or against the sink because I don't want it to sag under its own weight. And I'm squeezing it in a snake-like fashion, like hand over hand. Next I lay it out on a thick bath towel and cover it over so it won't touch itself and roll it up inside the towel and then you can gently step all over it and I'm wearing rubber soled slippers. And then you turn it over and you do the same thing. And if you're feeling very excited about your new top, you can do a little dancey movement. So still supporting the weight of the garment, I then lay it out on a large insulation board because it's stable and easy to stick pin, uh, pins into. I'm not really concerned about blocking the main part of the garment, but the lace really needs to be stretched out so the pattern opens up. And blocking wires make the process of pinning out much more efficient. So you weave them regularly through the edges of the knitting, and then you only need a few pins just to make the edge even, 
and the wires give it a consistent tension so that you can block it really hard. So I have threaded a wire on the front and, and on the back of the top edge of the lace, but because I've only got three wires, I'm threading my third wire through the front and back together on the bottom edge of the lace. So first I pinned the top wires down, and then I pull the bottom wires down as firmly as I can and pin it. And you can also stretch the sides out a bit as well. And then finally I take my tape measure to check that one side isn't longer than the other. And I'm not too fussed with blocking the neck because it'll look good when the garment is on. It'll stretch out naturally a little bit. So I'm just putting in a few pins. And then I have to wait for a couple of days until it's properly dry. And finally, here it is, dried and blocked, showing the beautiful architectural design of Caitlin's lace pattern. <laughs> My name is Pia Kammerborn and I will show you my mitten pattern Roses are red, violets are blue. I have always loved this little poem Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet and so are you. It's actually a very old poem and it can be traced back as far as the 16th century. It might sound childish or simple but I think it's often in the simple things that we can find true greatness like in pretty flowers or someone to love. So that's why I choose the name Roses are Red, Violets are Blue for my mitten. And you can choose whether you want to knit roses or violets in your mitten. Roses are a very common uh, pattern on uh, old traditional knitting from Gotland where I live. I want the roses and violets on my mitten to remind us of the warmth in the summer uh, during the darkest and coldest winter when we need warm and soft wool to warm our hands. Uh, I have knitted my mittens in uh, a two-ply sports weight yarn uh, from Ullcentrum. It's a Swedish wool yarn, but I'm sure you can also use Jameson, or Sm Jameson and Smith, for example, or Rauma Finul. It should work fine. Um, I wanted to make a fine, sophisticated ladies' mitten um, with a slim fit, almost uh, like a glove, and with special details. The mitten starts with a provisional cast on, and then there is a folded hem and the same color on the lining as on the flowers. So here there is uh, red in the lining and on the roses. And on this one there's uh, a blue lining and violets, blue violets. Uh, and the folding makes uh, a small pico border, which is a special detail that I like very much. Uh, the pattern shows how to use the first stitches from the pr provisional cast on um, to uh, knit the hem together with the mitten. And uh, then there comes this border with stranded knitting with the flowers where you can choose roses or violets uh, and it's surrounded by two Latvian braids. The rest of the mitten is knitted in one color and uh, on the inside of the mitten uh, there's a stockinette stitch, so it's very plain. And on the other side, uh, there is a pattern with um, pearl and, and knit and pearl stitches, so it's not very difficult. Uh, I have also made video tutorials and um, to show the parts that could be difficult, like um, the special techniques with provisional cast on and the Latvian braids. And in the pattern, there, is, uh, I, uh, there are links to these video tutorials. So I hope you will um, uh, like this uh, pattern. I'm uh, very satisfied with it. I think they uh, are beautiful and comfortable.
which is also a very important thing um, with the thumb and uh, the fitting. Uh, and uh, it's a fun knit. Thank you. Thank you, Pia, for your wonderful, beautiful contribution. I love the mitten patterns. They're beautiful. I think you can do them for me. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yes, roses are red. Yeah, well. I'm not sure whether I want the roses or violets. Anyway, so if you don't know um, Pia or her husband, Dennis, then you have a very lovely surprise ahead of you because they produce a very beautiful and charming, well-put-together podcast called Camabornia. So you can go and check them out later. But it's very, it's a gorgeous podcast. And when you watch it, you'll be transported to... Another a, world. A gentle <laughs> land of um, beauty and thoughtfulness and gentle, soft humour. So I think you'll really enjoy it. Now, I, uh, many of you know that I usually only buy yarn for projects that I'm about to start knitting on. So I don't go and recommend normally for people to buy things that they don't have an immediate use for. But in this circumstance, I would like to suggest that if you love Pierce mittens and that you would like to cue them for knitting up later, that you might consider buying them sooner rather than later to help support Pia and Dennis, who have been going or have been living on a very, very tight budget lately um, due to some illness and, and Dennis losing his job. And they are um, coming to the Edinburgh Yarn Festival as official podcasters. Yeah, that's right. So we're, they're one of the official podcasters. They're going to Edinburgh. Um, we're really excited about seeing them there and we know a lot of their fans are really excited about that as well. We think they make a lovely contribution to the knitting community so yeah if you are considering buying one of their patterns then maybe you can bring that purchase forward and support them in making that trip yeah pia has offered our patrons really generously a discount on all of her patterns so patrons go and check them all out and if there is anything that grabs your attention and has to be knitted by you then um, you can go off to patreon and find out the details about that discount yeah they're all beautiful charming swedish patterns yeah, yeah. and they're in sweet um swedish and english as yeah. well very well written out yeah we're always so happy to be able to thank our patrons by offering them these discounts whenever we can because it's their generosity that enables us to continue producing the content of this show we don't have sponsorship it's definitely full-time work and more so their financial support is my living and um, it really wouldn't go on without them. So if you are watching our show regularly and are enjoying it, then please support the show by becoming a patron. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this upcoming interview is fun and really entertaining. Alison O'Neill is living history. She's continuing the tradition of shepherding in the Yorkshire Dales as it has been practiced for hundreds of years. Alison herself is a real character. She's a combination of romantic and glamorous, but also tough and practical. Yeah. I find it a really fun combination. Yeah. So here comes that interview. Enjoy it. Yeah. And we'll see you in two weeks. Yep. Thanks for being with us today. Bye. Bye. The Howgills are my home, my heft, and the place where I belong. This is a landscape of skylarks, shepherds, and sheep. I am part of them and in turn they are part of me. Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. 
Back in episode 42, I interviewed the, the UK knitwear designer Marie Wallen and one of the things that Marie talked about were the beautiful tweed skirts that she uses to accompany her knitwear during photo shoots. Well today I'm in Cumbria in the UK with Alison O'Neill and Alison is the designer and creator of those beautiful tweed garments. So Alison is a shepherdess, but she's also a little bit of a personality because she's been um, featured in the UK media, including on the BBC. So we feel very excited to have Alison with us today on the podcast so that we can hear a little bit about her life as a shepherdess and what she's been doing with her wool. So thank you so much for inviting us to your studio and your farm. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll start off with the first question, and that is... Um, You've established a brand for yourself as a shepherdess, but you've actually got developed quite a portfolio of products and services <laughs> okay. based on your life as a sheep mm -hmm. farmer. So why don't you start there telling us um, all the kinds of things that you're doing? Yeah, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, yes, I am. I'm a shepherdess and a hill farmer, and I'm based in the Howgill Fells. And being a hill farmer in this area, you've got to think of diversification, think of ways of, of making it pay and being able to stay on the farm. It's a rented hill farm, so it's always about paying the rent. And the dream for my little girl was to be a shepherdess. And when I arrived, shepherding sheep wasn't just enough to pay all the bills, pay the rent and bring me and my daughter up and very much what we call a, a one-woman farm. So it's a one-woman show. Um, so I was already starting thinking of ways in which to make extra money. I'm a trained mountain leader, so I take ladies walking in the mountains and the fells of Cumbria and the Yorkshire Dales. I do barefoot walking where we experience hay meadows in the summer months and bluebell woods and apple orchards. And I also take people wild swimming into the rivers and lakes around the area as well. Um, but while all this was going on and appearing and doing inspirational talking about what I do as a shepherd, very much a woman in a man's world, I was surrounded by all this beautiful wool. And that was the one thing I hadn't actually started to use. Um, and it was really an experiment to wear something, to make something myself from the wool of my sheep. And that's where the wool is my bread and the shepherdess brand really got going. Okay, that is so much. <laughs> and I mean, these walks with bare feet and swimming in wild rivers sound fantastic. I think Andrew and I will have to <laughs> book a holiday sometime with you. So I've actually this year, I've been reading a few books um, by hill farmers here in this area. Mm -hmm. And I've really been enjoying them. And what I've got from the books is that the hill farmers in the Dales are very traditional and very hardworking. They're overwhelmingly male. Yes. And perhaps they're a little bit slow to accept newcomers. So what's interesting for me is, has your journey been difficult to be accepted and respected as a female shepherdess? Yeah, that's a great question. It has been. I mean, I'm very lucky that I was born and bred in these hills where we live. So I'm what we call born to it. Um, a Yorkshire woman who's always been here. I was raised by my grandparents, my parents, my grandfather who taught me incredibly well to smoke a pipe, spit and swear, which has helped me <laughs> greatly. <Tune. Yeah. laughs> um, so it was it was quite difficult. I was born and bred on a hill farm, but I moved away when I was 18 and travelled the world, um, sampling all the excitement that I thought there was as a, a girl that wanted to sort of grow to go to pastures greener, thought everything would be better. But I came back um, and 20 years ago, I took on a small hill farm called Shackler Bank, which is where I am, and I then began to set to, and, and quite rightly, it still is and was then very much a man's world. Uh, most of the shepherds I know were men. There are a few women getting out there now as shepherds, which is fantastic. Yeah. And the only way to prove yourself in this man's world is just to be a hard worker. It's your stock, it's the way you uh, uh, work yourself, it's by getting on with it, ignoring it, uh, sticking to sorting sheep, being a great stock woman. Um, and I think as a little girl, everything my grandfather taught me, gathering sheep at the age of four, going onto the fells, never complaining, never moaning about the weather, and just working really hard, but being passionate. Yeah. And I'm a romantic, and I love my sheep. I don't just like them, I love them. And I think I feel very grounded in part of my landscape. And I think it's all of those things. I am still surrounded by really grumpy shepherds who are who I'm probably related to. My grandfather was a miserable shepherd. My dad was a very hard man. Um, and I'm sort of in the middle somewhere I can be feminine, wear tweeds and wool, wear lipstick, go to the markets. But I get a good price. I can back my trailer. I can work a good dog. I'm not scared of being in the mud. I was out there this morning at five foddering on the fell. 
and but and I just absolutely love what I do and I think that's the thing and I think a lot of the male shepherds and farmers see the fact that you love it respect you and you just become one of them I'm yeah. just Alison Tommy Wynn's granddaughter yeah Farming. And, <laughs> and I could imagine if you can work a good shot uh, sheepdog and if yeah. you've got a good sheepdog then you, that gives you respect I, I think it does I mean I, I and if you can say... breed a good tap <laughs> ah well absolutely I mean I, the working I'm not I wouldn't win anything I certainly wouldn't win any awards on woman and his dog for working this thing but I have a, a mutual understanding with my dogs all the dogs are different and I do kind of do quite a feminine thing. I've I've actually got my flock so they all know me. It's not really about me gathering them with the dog. One holler and my girls come to me. So I have actually got a lovely understanding. I know them all by their faces, by their marks, their nature. I know their breeding lines. I know the sheep looks at me in the field. I know her mother, her grandmother, her great-grandmother. I know the father. I know the temperaments and... My girls are like groups of women. There are girls that are really nice, easy to get on with, the ones who are not so nice. <laughs> and there are girls who really don't like each other. They're very different. And I, I sort of shepherd very differently to a lot of men and a lot of female shepherdesses. To so me, the dog is important, but what's more important is my relationship with the flock yeah. and the sheep. And I, I breed for um, the meat, but I more breed for the wool now. I mean, mm. I'm really looking at the wool and a good fleece. Mm. Um, so that 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 really that really is a thing for me. It's that lovely understanding, and it's not about size. I used to think you need to be a big, strong man out in the fields and the weather, you know, gathering. Uh, it isn't. It, being a small, petite woman, it's what's here. It's watching your flock, uh, going with the girls, and and I've my thing is really to breed what we call a good gimmer or a good yow I'm just really into the girls yeah. the boys and the big tops I leave for the men yeah they um, get excited it's a bit of a testosterone it. thing it's yeah. you know he's oh, got you know I've just read about tonsilling <laughs> which is uh, yeah. on, on show day <laughs> uh, of making sure that the white yeah. and black lines are very absolutely. clean absolutely I mean I, I do show my sheep and I've got what I call three show girls mm -hmm. um, of the three different breeds we've got Swaledale we've got Kendall Raffel and we've got Herdwick all native breeds to Cumbria and the Dales here and I like to show all three but I do it in a very Alison Shepherdess way the girls all look their part I like them to look really traditional not too tarted up <laughs> I like my girls when they've come off the fell they've been cleaned up yeah. um, but it's important that I'm wearing their wool and their tweeds yes. and me and the girls have to look great but at the same time I'm quite with it yeah. and um, the three show girls are named after great shepherdesses that I've known I've got okay. Morag who's a herdwick, who is feisty, grumpy, naughty, doesn't suffer fools, and she's named after a lady called Morag McKinnon, uh, who is a 93-year-old shepherdess on the Isle of Harris. Okay. Um, I've got Maggie, who is a Kendall Ruffell sheep, and she's named after my grandma, who was Maggie Smith, a great shepherd, a much more gentler lady. She would walk the Haugefells barefoot. She would sing, count skylarks, taught me everything I knew to be a shepherd, very endearing taught me that a sheep is a wonderful creature. It's not just a sheep. It's like a person. We mm. must respect them. We take their wool, we use their meat, and they offer us a life of solitude. They offer us, um, a, you know, a living. So I really value my girls. I mean, I'm a very soft shepherdess compared mm. to many. Um, so that's Maggie. And then I've got Mary, and she's a really quite deer-like, headstrong girl who's a swaledale or we say swaddle up here um and she's named after a great friend of mine uh, marianne morrison also a shepherdess so i i do tend to give them names i do personalize the flock i do send them off uh, for meat but i do put all the meat into the best restaurants Ascombe hall um the georgian dragon i do it all myself nobody ever goes to slaughter it in a wagon it's me taking them it breaks my heart i don't like playing god but i do it i see mm. them in and i see them out mm -hmm. um and then i use their wall so i feel i'm giving value mm. to these beautiful creatures yeah. that know you remember you recognize you mm. um so i'm very much um i like the girls so mm. i love my girls the boys once a year they're in for a month or so and then they're gone but I'm a, I like my girls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds beautiful. Well, I can hear your love of, of <laughs> the 
of the lifestyle and your sheep, yeah, just coming mm -hmm. through. So tell us, uh, what does, what made you decide to start using the fleece okay. as um, tweed yeah. and then go on and talk about the whole production yeah. process from fleece yeah. to finished garment? Okay. Um, well, I started using it um, really out of necessity. And remember, I've always worn tweed. Um, and I have always worn Harris tweed jackets, of which my grandparents gave me my first one when I was 12. And I used to ride the fell on my horse, which I still do. Um, and I was wearing it and loving it. But I was also remembering the lovely song, Do Ken John Peel With His Coat So Grey? Yes. And that's Herdwick. That was made from wool from the sheep. And I also found an old jacket uh, that was made from a Herdwick Swaledale mix. And I started to think, this is mad. You know, I'm guiding the mountains wearing Scottish tweeds. I should be wearing my Yorkshire tweeds, my Cumbrian tweeds. Yeah. Why am I not wearing my wool? And the truth is, I was burning my wool. Yeah. I used to burn my yeah. wool. The price was so bad. I think about four pence for a fleece. Me and my nephew were clipping. It was costing about £2.50 to clip to send it to the wool board. So I just decided to take the whole lot and have it turned into yarn. And I knew nothing of this. Uh, I knew nothing about the process. Yeah. I'm not an expert on wool. I am on sheep but not wool. So I, I really bundled the full wool clip of mine, which was about 200 fleeces, a mixture of Herdwick, Swaledale and Kendall Ruffell. I was told that none of it would make great tweed. It would all be itchy, scratchy. Nobody would wear it. Nobody would buy it. And you're wasting your time. But people had also said that and took on a hill farm 20 yeah. years ago <laughs> as a woman on my own with a child. Yes. Um, so I bundled it all into a very old four-wheel drive with an old trailer. And I made a trip to a place called Ghoul in Yorkshire, to a spinning mill. I left the wool. I had a brief conversation with Paul to keep it natural. Mm -hmm. I wanted the Herdwicks to look like the Herdwicks in the field. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to look itchy, scratchy. I wanted it to look substantial and strong. I wanted the Swaledales to replicate the limestone pavements in the dales, the rough fell with the Howgill fells and the stones. And I sort of got in my car and headed back to the farm, and three months, four months passed... And I never thought anything would happen. I'd taken this little studio at Farfield Mill. And down below me is a weaver called David and two looms. And David said, when the yarn comes back, we'll turn it into tweed. And that was it. I, I couldn't imagine what happened. But suddenly these plastic bags arrived with these cones of okay. yarn. And they're on the rough fell. This is the rough fell fleece. Now that's been washed, mm -hmm. so it's quite a long fibre. Yeah. And that was the washed, washed stage, but I knew I couldn't make a tweed just from cream because people would yeah. buy it. I was already starting to think, what will I wear? I wanted to wear a rough fell tweed that looked like my sheep. Now, rough fell sheep have got these beautiful black and white faces. Yes. Beautiful face. They're the biggest of the native breeds in the United Kingdom, but they're very gentle girls. I wanted the tweed to look like them. And this was the tweed that, between David and I, were designed. It's a lovely diamond weave. Rough fell sheep are also known as rough diamonds locally. Okay, So we wanted the perfect. rough diamond to come into the tweed. We wanted the black and white. So that when I stood next to the sheep and had some photo shoots done, people could see the sheep, re recognise yes. it, and give total provenance. Because in all my products, not only can I give provenance of the flock number, which mine is 107682, I can say which sheep they came from, what year they were clipped, and what hill farm they're from. So you've got the full line. Yeah. We wove this one up. This was the rough fell. Okay. If I can show you the example. Yes. And on the back here, this is all the rough fell yarn. I dyed half of it, a lovely dark charcoal, nearly black, mm -hmm. and half of it stayed natural. And it went into products like bags, yeah. jackets, but very slowly early on. This one which here is the lovely wool that came back. Okay. This is the Swaledale. I was telling you about Mary. Yes. Um, you've got the three sheep to get set. Swaledale. And this is the Swaledale tweed. And the reason I went with these lovely colours here, again, it's part dyed, because Swaledale washes out a quite a strange yellow colour. It's not yes. a nice colour. So I did dye it again with natural organic dyes, two colours, the greys. This replicates the gorgeous colours of the limestone pavements and the stone walls in the Yorkshire Dales. So okay. I wanted to keep it so you it were does. wearing... Yes. These lovely colours, like the colours on here and the jackets and things. Yeah. So that's the Swaledale. Mm -hmm. And then the Herdwick has been spun into kind of... We made quite a few different tweeds from this. This one is what we call a hog tweed. And that's predominantly from the younger sheep. Now, Herdwicks are born jet black. And then they go chocolate brown. 
then they go a kind of strange, lovely sort of warm chestnut. Then they go dark grey, then they go light grey, mm. then they go white. So Herdwick's brilliant because you can make so many tweeds using different walls and come up with gorgeous colours. Again, lovely, natural and warm. Yeah. This is also Herdwick. The darker is probably a two- or three-year-old sheep's wool, yes. and the lighter is probably from a five- or six-year-old sheep. Okay, So yeah. constantly playing with colours but keeping them natural. And that's really how I started. We made the first few pieces... I fashioned them into jackets and skirts. Initially, mm -hmm. I was making them myself. Mm -hmm. I wanted everything to be made in the UK locally. It was leather buttons. It was the English Velvet Company. It was using everything that I could find and source. So everything was kind of made within the UK. I mean, most of everything I do is made within 50 miles of the farm and this mill. So very sort of tight there. Uh, but also work for me and work for the people. Uh, I fashioned a few bags. Okay, so I yes. designed the bags. Uh, this is a lovely backpack and everything about my little brand, I called it Shepherdess because that's what I am. And everything I produce is connected to sheep and wool. Um, and this is a lovely backpack. I wanted a great backpack that I could carry out on the fells because, as you know, I take people walking, yes, yeah. mostly ladies. I wanted one that was really comfortable. Always tend to have this on, which is what we call the, <laughs> the Shepherdess whistle. <laughs> Uh, used for heralding children, uh, lady walkers and sheep and dogs. <laughs> and so that was kind of put on the back, but it's also brilliant if you're in the hills to, yes. to call a, a cry if, anybody, yeah. if you get lost. Yeah. But it was to make it really comfortable, wearable, stylish, with wool. Um, and I found a great company who would hand make these bags for me. I mean, this little rucksack alone will probably take somebody about a week to actually make the tweed with the leather, English leather. And that just came to be, and everything I suppose that I've developed is something that I might wear that ladies would find useful comfortable hard wearing and look better as it get older yeah. this one is lovely um this is what I call it. it's a little it's a this is actually Swaledale Herdwick mm -hmm. and I call it the working jerkin um because <laughs> it's very much something you would throw over you yeah. could throw it over a lovely warm knit jumper jeans yes, it keeps skirt, your torso warm torso yeah. warm deep pockets for keys dog leads lipstick a bale of twine, <laughs> shears, you name it. And it, again, that's designed on my father is 90. He's called Tommy Wynn. He still shepherds a few sheep. He walks every day. He's out in the hills. And he and he has this lovely old waistcoat in wool that he's had yeah. forever. Yeah. Um, and I said, oh, Dad, I, you know, I want one. So I fashioned one. I tend to put leather belts across mine to sort of pull yeah. the waist in if you want a bit of a waist. A little bit of feminine And touch. some of them have actually got belt loops for ladies if they want a lovely okay. feminine touch in the waist yeah. there. And I said to Dad, I'm going to call it a lovely sort of working waistcoat. And he said, no, nah, lass, it's a working jerkin. <laughs> <laughs> so the land girl is, this jacket was a jacket that my grandma, um, the copy, I copied it, absolute jacket. A uh, land girl that worked at her farm okay. actually left the jacket. So okay. this is the copy of the original land girl jacket. The working jerkin is my father's old Yorkshire working waistcoat. Um, and this, I call it a shepherd's cowl. It's a piece of tweed. And it's lined inside with lamb's wool. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just kind of really over the head. Yeah. And it just keeps you so warm and cosy. It keeps the cold winds yeah. out and you took it down inside. And a shepherd's cowl, because when I'm on the top and the wind's really buffeting and blowing, you often find it, it sort of goes down. You can exactly. sort of tuck it in. Um, and I'm really joyed because so many quite famous shepherds are now wearing my shepherd's really? cowls. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this year... And there's quite a few famous shepherds around they here, They have. I've got uh, James Rebank. <laughs> Herdwick Shepherd, he wears uh -huh. this one, which is Herdwick, lined with yes. lamb's wool. Gareth Wynne-Jones, famous Welsh Shepherd, he's yeah. got the rough fell one. Red Shepherdess has one. Okay. I have one. <laughs> so it's, but it's not just shepherds, because yeah. a lot of the ladies, they don't live in the country. They don't have farms, they don't have sheep, but they love sheep, they love wool, they love the thought of this life of freedom yeah. and solitary. Yeah. And... It's a connection for them. Well, they like wearing it because this one lady said she wears, uh, she she walks across, I think it's Regent's Park with her dog in London and she has the shepherdess, land girl. And she says she feels when she's wearing it, she's striding out on the moors or the hills, <laughs> gathering her flock. Um, but I think they feel closer to the sheep. And it, it's great because I know so many great knitters. I'm not a knitter. I yeah. love knitwear. I had this gorgeous cardigan made for me. Um <laughs> 
But it's lovely because the tweed, I feel the tweed complements all the great knitters. It totally things. does, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And the skirts that Marie Wallen that I yeah. mentioned earlier, they just look totally beautiful with Fair Isle. And, oh, that's the yeah. thing. I mean, I'm obsessed with Fair Isle. Yeah. And um, I have to say, when Marie first asked me, I couldn't believe it because... I'm very lucky that I do have quite a lot of Marie's gorgeous creations that yeah. Marie's given me um, and I've had knit for me yeah. and I, I'm mad about knitwear but I'm not yeah. a knitter yeah. um, so the fact that she feels and other knitters feel that my tweeds complement their work is match made in heaven for me yeah that's fantastic it yeah. is so it'll be exciting to see a little bit of your farm as well yeah. we're going to go and and do that yeah. soon so thank you so much for talking <laughs> about your life it's very exciting you could thank sit you. for hours and listen to <laughs> <laughs> what goes on here and showing us some of your beautiful garments okay thank you so much i've really enjoyed it yeah <laughs> thank you okay so we'll say goodbye to the audience bye <laughs> Step we gaily on we go, heel for heel and toe for toe, arm and arm and arm we go, all for Murray's wedding. Over hillways, up and down, myrtle green and bracken brown, past the shilling through the town, all for sake of Murray. Step we gaily on we go, heel for heel and toe for toe, arm and arm and arm we go, all for Murray's wedding. Plenty herring, plenty meal, plenty pig to fill her creel, plenty barley barns as well. Let's go.